Reza, and when he first came to Waterloo, and he said, oh, my name is Mohammed Reza, and I said, there's too many Mohammeds, so I can call you Reza. Yeah. That's how he but, started, uh, yeah. I think there's one professor in civil engineering that has uh, one Mohammed and another Mohammed. Yeah. Uh, so it's Reza Jalali to me, but it's Mohammed Reza, of course, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, he graduated here in uh, 2013 uh, and did work on a uh, couple of geomechanics, heat transfer, and jointed rock mass, which turned out to be an extremely challenging problem because when you cool the rock mass, you get similar elastic shrinkage, and the joints open up. So the hydraulic conductivity of the joints changes by an order of magnitude or more. And then when you heat the rock up, the joints tend to close them. The rock is expanding. So you have extreme, extreme nonlinearity in this class of problems. So that was the kind of uh, job that he, uh, that he addressed uh, for us uh, during his uh, PhD work here. But before that, he was doing work on uh, induced seismicity in oil fields in Iran, where uh, he and his uh, supervisor at the University of Tehran collected information uh, from the uh, the uh, seismological network in Iran and uh, correlated local hotspots of seismic activity to uh, oil field uh, injection and production operations in a number of oil fields mm -hmm. in uh, in uh, southern Iran and like near near uh, million near Khoramshah and yeah, it's uh, Ahwaz also, Ahwaz, yeah, yeah. Ahwaz so uh, that was his master. So that's not too bad uh, background for geomechanics. And now, uh, for the last four years, we're working with a team. All the names. Yeah. <laughs> there are more, but they. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In uh, Zurich, uh, ETH, which is one of, the, one of the best universities in the world, and the Swiss are relatively serious about geothermal energy, uh, low grade and intermediate grade geothermal energy. So they're putting a lot of money into seeing whether or not this can be a viable technology for. Switzerland as they try to undergo decarbonization because remember there's no oil and gas whatsoever in Switzerland. Any oil and gas that comes into Switzerland is, is important. So Reza is working on that team for the last four years and he's kind of graduated from being a postdoctoral fellow to now being a, a lecturer and a researcher. We, we call him in Canada probably a, a research associate or a research assistant professor. Probably I think research assistant professor would probably be the right mm -hmm. equivalent of right. So Reza is going to uh, summarize for us some of the geomechanics uh, issues uh, that he's been working on on this geothermal project in uh, in ETH in Switzerland. And thank you very much for offering to give us this talk, Reza. Mm, okay. uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Maurice, for the introduction. So I'm just gonna shows some of the outcome of the experiment we did in Switzerland and also tell you, explain you what we are doing there and what's the idea behind. And it's mostly like these are the, mostly it's the raw data or observation we have. So we are still doing some analysis, I hope. Like we could also have some discussion and also your comments are welcome uh, for this talk. So here, as Muri said that we are, it's a big group. Actually, we didn't put the name of the professors there because these are the actual people really in the field. But you should add maybe 10 more people there that they haven't been there. And uh, as Maurice said, I'm going to talk about the hydraulic stimulation and hydraulic, I mean, hydraulic stimulation and the uh, field characterization in the process of the deep geothermal energy in Switzerland. So I just put the outline because I'm going to talk about different topics there. So I just like know somehow where we are, what we want to do. And also during the presentation, if you get lost, you can see at the bottom, I usually highlight where we are, then you can just kind of follow back with the, in the talk. So just a brief, at the beginning, a brief introduction of why Switzerland, they want to go to deep geothermal energy and what are the challenges. Then I will introduce the field site that we are working. It's actually it's a deep underground rock laboratory that I will show you some pictures and just also explain you a little bit about the location and what we are doing there. Then. We did a, like a, I divided this talk to like a, three main like a topics. First is the characterization. We want to know what's going on there. And we just did different characterization, like a stress measurement, hydraulic characterization, geophysical. And 
after each characterization, we do a main test, which we did a hydraulic stimulation, which is actually hydro shearing. We inject in one of the existing faults. We try to open it and shear it. Also, we did some hydrofracking in different places that we didn't have any fractures. Then again, after of each these tests, we do some characterization. So characterization before and after of each main activity is what we are doing. At the same time, we have some monitoring system that during the shearing or the hydrofracking, we monitor different components, like a pressure, seismic, strain, strain. So this is the whole kind of like a topic that I'm going to show you, I mean, mostly the results. So as a background, Switzerland has decided to stop using nuclear, uh, nuclear reactors by the end of 2034. I mean, beginning of 2035. And this accounts for 25% of the electricity generation of whole Switzerland. So the idea is that they want to just, I mean, replace these nuclear like uh, refineries by some kind of renewable energy. So the idea is that they want to use 18% of these 25%. Uh, they compensated by the hydropower plant. So there is another group in Switzerland. They already started since four years ago. They are working on the increasing the efficiency of the turbines and also efficiency of the dams. This is stuff. This is not part of this talk. What we are dealing actually is that this seven percent, which is left of the total. So just give you some ideas. It's around 4.4 terawatt per hour per year or the install capacity of 500 megawatt. These are like the, some numbers to you know what kind of values we are dealing with. And the idea is that they want to install 20, uh, they want to start install 25 geothermal power plants with the capacity of 20 megawatt per year between 2025, 2050. So it's a big number. And just, I mean, I guess for me, these values, I don't have a, that much feeling. But if you want to know the feeling is that 20 megawatt capacity is about 220 liter per second water with the temperature of 107 to 190. It's a really big number. And this is in the case that the efficiency is 100%, which you cannot get it. So it's a really big number, and they are really dealing with the big number there. Yes? Um, would that not cool down the well too much? Uh, so the idea is that I guess for the geothermal, I, the idea is that you usually just go with the duplex. So just real two boreholes. It could be inclined or horizontal, depends on the like a, a stress condition or structure you have. Then you kind of create a, res, a reservoir between that. So you are in the depths of four to six kilometer. Your permeability is super low, so you need to do some stimulation activities, hydro fracking and hydraulic shearing. You make a reservoir. You increase the permeability. Then you start circulating the water. Said this is a lot of energy. Yes. So what I'm saying, after we've removed that energy, are we cooling down that? Well? Yes, we are cooling down, but I guess there are lots of uh, like are the. Replenishing that heater just yes, in that case, you usually have it because you are in the four to six kilometer, you have a thermal gradient of, I mean, you have a temperature of 170 to 190, but there is a source, like a heat energy that is coming up. So usually it's not like a reservoir that you cool it down and it's going away. You have a, like a, you know, this, the source of energy, like heat that is just coming up mostly from the deep underground. So, but of course you are not gonna, you don't want to have a, like a direct channels between two boreholes because then you don't like, you cool down the rock, you will not have it. So you, the idea is you make a reservoir, fracture reservoir that the water goes through different fractures and you have enough like a staying time there for the water to warm up and comes out and also at the same time you have enough time to warm up the rock again. So these values is really big. I mean also Switzerland is not like a place with a high ter thermal gradient. So the thermal gradient is around 25 to 30 degrees per, kil per kilometer. So for this case the idea is that we go to that deep and like kind of like having the like a deep like a crystalline base like stimulate the crystalline base like we will not have that much hydrothermal to just compensate these values but there are two problems two main problems that already happened the two main problem first is that how we can make a reservoir in the four to six kilometer we don't have that much fractures and we don't have that much permeability so the first question is that how we make this reservoir at the same time we keep the level of induced seismicity in a acceptable range so i don't know if you you were following news or not in 2007 in city of basel north of switzerland they tried and they drilled a five kilometer borehole 
and they start doing the stimulation there. And they had a, it was around December 2006. They had the earthquake of 2.9. They shut down the well. Four days after, they have a swarm of the earthquakes, like three or four, with magnitude, magnitude 3.2. So that was a big thing, because the borehole was in the middle of the city, and you could see the houses. There were some cracks. And also, it's a really populated area. So that was the one project which, is, which was shut, shut down. Then in 2013, they start again in St. Gallen. It's the northeast of Switzerland. They try to actually inject again in the depths of three kilometers. So when they inject, they hit a gas layer. So there was a gas kick in the borehole. They shut down the borehole. They had an earthquake of 3.5 after. So these two like a kind of like a failed experiments uh, happened in Switzerland. And then they decided now for the, this new initiative which has started from 2014, which is called the Swiss Competence Center of Energy uh, Research. So the idea now here is that we are interested to look at the individual like mechanisms from the small scale to big scale. And the idea is that we try to understand all the involved mechanisms in the, during the stimulation and circulation for the geothermal and also understanding the effect of the stimulation on the seismicity. So this is the whole concept that why we are doing this and what we are actually looking for that. So the idea is start that we start from a really small scale, lab scale, the, the range of 10 centimeters, and then we increase the scale by, by order. So we have a lab scale. We have different like, key questions that we are going to answer. So we have a lab scale, then we have a shear experiment scale. So this lab scale actually happening in Zurich, in ETH, and also in Berkeley, University of Berkeley, not the national lab. Shear experiment is, might happen in ASPO in Sweden. So this is still under discussion. Uh, this is the experiment that I'm going to talk about. Grimsel experiment is in Switzerland, the, the field site. Then next year, we are going to the larger scale, which is 100 meter, which is in the Bedretto, is in the southern part of the Switzerland. So the idea is that we look at different scales and try to just like answer different key questions to understand the, all the coupled mechanism involved in the hydro shearing and hydro fracking of the, for the geothermal, for creating the fracture, to creating the geothermal reservoir. So just as I said, I'm going to, to talk about the field site it's called Grimsel test site. So it's this, this site built around 1982, mostly for the nuclear waste repository. So they wanted to have a, like a rock laboratory underground to just do some like different tests concerning the nuclear waste repository. But by the end of 80s, Switzerland has decided to go toward the clay, opalinous clay for the uh, repository and for the test. So, they stopped doing any nuclear waste repository studies here in Grimsel, so they moved to Monterey, which is like northwest. So we are here in the middle. And now it's open for different experiments. So we had this chance that because of the big infrastructure is there, exists there, so we had the chance to go there in this crystalline rock laboratory and we do our test. So the, the field site is located here. We have a dam here and the dam here, and there is a tunnel between these two dams. And the rock laboratory is located somehow underneath here, which I will show you some more pictures uh, about that site. So before we start doing any tests, we, had, we needed to fulfill some requirements for the, this stimulation or fracking experiment. First, we needed to have experimental rock volumes. We needed to have a rock volume that has some existing fractures that we could stimulate, actually. We increase the permeability, and we somehow create the reservoirs that we, are, uh, we like to have it. So we found this a nice spot in the part of the tunnel there, which I will show you in the next slide how it looked like. Then it was important that we have enough shear stresses on these structures, because we want to actually open the fractures. And by increasing the pressure, and these fractures shear, that as soon as we drop the pressure, they, they don't go back completely. They don't close completely. So we just want to keep them open. And so we need to have enough shear stress on these fractures that we start having the shearing. Then we needed to have a, like a really compressive injection protocol. We just don't want to inject water and just open the fractures without knowing anything. And also we need to understand how much we increase the injectivity and how we, be, we affect the behavior of the rock. So we needed to have a comprehensive injection protocol, which I'm going to also talk about those stuff. At the same time, we need to monitor all, I mean, 
as much as physics as we can, which is happening during this injection, both for hydrofracking and hydrosharing. So we need to monitor the key parameters. And finally, also looking at the microseismic activities, because that's the, one of the key questions that we have. So we want to kind of monitor all, I mean, most of the physics that we can during this experiment. So here you can see the, oh, the video is not that good here. So here you can see the kind of like a plot of the rock laboratory. This is the main tunnel that I told you. So here is one dam, the other one is another dam. And you see there are different branches which is the TBM like uh, tunnels that they drilled. And this is actually, it's like where the rock laboratory is located. The overburden is around f like a 500 meter we have above here. So we are in this, like here is north and we are in the located in the southern part of the lab. So you cannot see here, but the nice thing here is that we can have some structures here that you can see the structures are also here. We have two main tunnels, that is this tunnel and the other tunnel. And the nice thing is that we have another tunnel which is kind of upstairs. So we have around 10 meters above. So it gives us like a really nice access to monitor and characterize the structures between these, like, uh, these tunnels. Here you can see the main structure we have. We have a main structure which is called S3. This is the name because it's east-west. And this is really like it's a metabol two metabolic dikes that they sheared. And between them, we have a really brittle fracture media. Then we have these like a structures, which is north, east, southwest, that they are also like a, there are some like dikes also, which is intersecting these boreholes. So this is the whole like the geology we have. I'm not going to talk about too much about the geology, but the idea for us was that we want to stimulate individual fractures by putting the packers on each of these structures, increase the pressure and try to shear them individually and looking at the micro seismicity. So here is the timeline of the experiment, what we did. So we start like the blue lines showing the characterization part. So you see before each main experiment, we did a characterization. So everything, the main characterization start in like last August. So we had a characterization for five, six months. Then we did a higher shearing, high hydraulic shearing experiment. So the idea is that we increase the pressure in one of the existing fractures. And because of the shear stress on that fracture, it's going to slip. And as soon as we remove the pressure, the fracture will stay open. So it increases the permeability of the structure. Then we have another characterization between February and May, like three, four weeks ago. Then we did a hydrofracking experiment. So the idea here was that we were actually increasing pressure in the intervals or in the part of the rock that there is no fracture exists. So we are going to open it. And hopefully, maybe we will have also some, like the, some shearing as well. So we'll increase the, the permeability. But the main idea was that we wanted to connect the existing structures together. So using this hydrofrack. The hydrofracking that we are doing is, is not exactly what they are doing in oil and gas. Here we only used water. The normal water that we had there we used water. Also for some of them we used some chemicals to increase the viscosity. But these are these chemicals, it wasn't actually chemical. So it was a, like a santan which is coming from food, food industry which I will show you later on. Then we have a characterization which is going on now. So again, each characterization, we do it before and after because we want to see the effect of all these like a hydro shearing and fracturing mechanisms. Then after, in, hopefully in September, we are going to do a circulation experiment. So the idea is that we are going to circulate cold and hot water in the reservoir and we are going to look at the mechanical effect and also seismicity and also hydraulic on the different structures. So here it shows the number of boreholes we have. So total, we have 15 boreholes. So each borehole with different colors, like they just kind of, they drill for different purposes. So we had these tr black boreholes, which we call it like uh, SPH boreholes. These are mostly for stress measurements. Because if you remember, I showed you five components for the hydro shearing. And this is for, to understand the second component, which is the amount of stress on the structure. We need to know how much is the stress on the system. So, we drill these three boreholes with different purposes. Then we have two main injection boreholes, which are shown by the blue color. And these are actually goes down. You will see later on with the respect to the structure. And they're going to intersect all the structures that we have. Then we have four boreholes, which is mostly for geophysical boreholes, the yellow line. 
These are mostly used for the, doing some active seismic and also GPR, ground penetration radar. Also, we use this borehole during the stimulation to monitor the hydrofracking and hydro shearing, I mean, mostly with the seismicity, because we start putting some a piezo sensors or seismic sensors inside these boreholes. We had three pressure monitoring boreholes, which are shown with the green color. You can see them, I mean, how is they are drilled, and some also three strain monitoring boreholes, both continuous and FPG, which I will show you later on. So it's Switzerland, so it's kind of like Swiss cheese. So we drill lots of these boreholes. We had some problems also with knowing because it's a really dense area and we, we didn't know actually if these boreholes are gonna intersect or not. So we didn't have a technology of the previous talk. So what we did that we run a gyro inside all these boreholes. When we were drilling a borehole, we run a gyro. Then we had this co constraint for us that whenever we wanna drill a borehole, we make sure that we are not gonna be closer than one meter to the other one. So it was really difficult at the end to just put the last two boreholes in this like a really dense network. So now just going toward the characterization, I showed you like in the last slide that we had three boreholes. You can see it here, the three red one. So first we did some stress measurements. So we used two different kind of stress measurement methods. I'm not gonna talk about that much. Possibly you are familiar with those. So we use the overcoring, which is like a typical mining and civil, I guess, stress measurement that we use the USBM and CSIRO. So the idea is that you just drill a small hole inside the, inside the borehole. Then you just put your probe inside that it has some strain gauges. Then you overcore this, like uh, this core. You bring back everything. Then you try to compress it again to, go, to just make the strain measure to the zero. This is somehow you can measure the like a 2D or 3D in situ stress conditions. At the same time, we did like also different hydrofracs. So we did total, I guess like four, three, five. So we did total 12 hydrofracs also different because we wanna know also what's the magnitude of the minimum stress and also what's the orientation of the minimum stress. So again, this is like we presented this work in the ARMA last week. So we did different like analysis and somehow we got a really nice in situ stress like the tensor out of this stress measurement. But I just wanna show you the message here is that we really need to know how is the stress, in situ stress condition before we start to do any experiment there. Then we had the we need to also understand how the hydraulic and thermal condition of the reservoir is. And usually with the thermal, with the hydraulic characterization, you don't get a, like a, you just get a single value for different tests you are doing based on the duration and the radius of influence. So we div divided our test to three different scale. Borehole scale, which we are interested to the hydraulic characterization around the borehole to know how are the, uh, how the environment around the borehole is, then we were interested between to the cross hole and at the same time reservoir scale. So I'm not gonna talk about this stuff. If you are interested, we can discuss about uh, all these details. So I just t like mentioned a couple of them. For example, we did some pulse tests because we wanted to see first if we have any fractures around the borehole or not. Because as I said, we had hydro shearing. So we were injecting actually in the intervals that we have a fractures. So to know if we have a fracture or not, we need to do this simple pulse test. We just inject a pulse of water and we see how the pressure like decays. And with this case, we know if we have a fracture or if we don't have any fracture, the pressure stays constant. And also we need to characterize, get some values about like the properties, like a permeability and storativity of the reservoir. So we did different like a kind of injection test. Then we, we have different boreholes as I showed you and we wanna see how these boreholes are connected, how these fractures are connected with each other and if it's connected, what are the hydraulic properties? Again, we did different kind of tests there to understand the hydraulic between the two boreholes and we have also conduct some reservoir scale tracer tests to know if we inject different tracers, how will be the transport properties? Here I just show you like a really nice video. This is like one of my favorite videos. And here you can see the different, the time lapse of the GPR measurements we did. And if you look at here, you see a line that is just like, you see here is a, like a line that is like moves upward. This is actually, is the GPR, like this is the tracer test we did. We inject salt, so we add like around three, we add around three kilo of salt 
in 50 liters of water, so we increase the conductivity of the water by three orders. We add ethanol there because, because when you add salt to the water, you increase the density. So in order to just have the similar, similar characteristics of the in-situ water, we add ethanol there around 30%. So it was actually a, 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 almost a cocktail there. And then we inject this salt water. And in the different times, we were just doing GPR measurement. And here you can see, this is the salt water, how it moves. This is a time lapse. So it's just like we could really nicely see that the salt water front is moving in the GPR measurement. So this is the, 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 just the idea how this hydraulic characterization happened. At the same time, we did some also geophysical characterization. First, we want to see how are the structure is. The hydraulic characterization doesn't give us that much about a structure. So we did some GPR measurement. And here you can see based on the, we have different reflections for different structures. Also, we did some seismic tomography. So we have tunnels, we have boreholes. So we were just doing some active seismic and using different data that we were getting, like the velocity. Here, for example, you see the slow velocity shows some of the shear zones we have. Or we also look at the anisotropy of the uh, velocity, and it could give us some indication of the foliation. So these are like, again, it's like different techniques that we can use to just understand, get more information about the reservoirs. And the last one is that the 3D seismic that we conducted during each hydrofracking and hydraulic stimulation to understand how is the, like the amount of water we are injecting moving inside the structures. So if you have any question, you can stop me all the time. I just go a bit fast because I just give you a taste of what we, we did. Then you can just discuss if you are interested in different aspects. And now, I mean, we talk about characterization, what we did before and after. Now we want to go to the field and actually do the stimulation, do the hydro shearing or hydrofracking. So we need to have a, like a really robust monitoring system to monitor also different aspects of the hydro shearing. So the first thing that we were interested in was, was the pressure. So how the pressure is propagating inside the reservoir during the stimulation. Here you can see the pressure monitor boreholes we have. So I just put a two cross section. Here is the AA prime. You can see here is the cross section. And here you can see the distance of the boreholes we have. So these are the, the green one is two injection boreholes we have. They are almost 10 meters away in the, these structures that we have is one of the structures. Then you can see the range. We have a really like a, the natural flow is toward this tunnel, which is this one. Because we have a tunnel, so it's the, all the water that is inside the fracture flows toward this tunnel. And also, whenever we inject, we do any hydrofrac, not hydrofrac, actually, any hydro shearing we do, the water tends to go toward here. Because of that, we put two monitoring boreholes here and two monitoring boreholes here in order to capture as much as we can of the pressure changes. Also, we had some other open boreholes that we usually put a flow meter. So we try to complete as much as we can the boreholes, not to having these holes of the Swiss cheese. So we complete boreholes with a, like a really nice completion protocols. So we didn't use any metals for the completion because we want to do some geophysics. And having metal, especially for GPR, is a, like a, it's a big problem. So we use like a really like a heavy duty PVC. And we have a, like a pressure line, injection lines. We have a, like a resin. Also, we in, use some fiber optics there for the temperature. So we have a, like a really sophisticated completion boreholes for the dispersion monitoring uh, wells. So you see, we had like for each test, we have 12 pressure monitoring points for each test. So which could give us like a really nice, you will see a idea about how these pressure fronts propagating during the hydrofracking or hydro shearing. Then also we were interested to monitor seismicity. So total we have 14 piezo electric acoustic emission sensors we installed in the boreholes. Here you can see it with the green color. <coughs> These are not calibrated sensors. So for this case, we also installed like five calibrated accelerometers with the red color. You can see it here in the boreholes. Somehow like kind of like oriented around like the downward which could monitor the stimulation area, which is here. And also, we installed some like the borehole sensors as well, 12 in these boreholes, the, the pink one you can see, which is also 
this is mostly for the passive seismic. For the active seismic, we have some hammers in the tunnels that we could just use the hammer to just make some like the active pulse, I mean, for the seismic. And also we have some sensors inside the borehole which could make actually this kind of like active source for us. So we will, in this configuration, we could see the seismicity uh, live. Uh, using this like the sensors also at the same time we could do active seismic every 10 minutes during the stimulation. And the last but not least, we also interested to monitor the strain and tilt. So we had three main boreholes that we installed some FPG sensors. It's a fiber bright gradient, so it has a, a specific baseline that you can see in this borehole, like the, these boreholes that how they are like installed. Also, we wanted to also look at the application of the continuous size, it's continuous strain. So we installed also two loop of the continuous uh, strain monitoring system in three boreholes. Here. Of course, we wanted also to see the effect of tilts because that's the mostly the kind of the most reliable kind of measurements during the real geothermal phase. So we installed also three tilt meters on the other side of the borehole. So we tried to put as much as sensors we can, as much as sensor we can to monitor the physics of this test. So now we go talk about the hydro shearings. The, the main experiment, one of the first experiment we did. So in this case, we conducted six different tests, you can see. The pressure uh, is shown by the red color, the blue color is the flow rate, and you, you see they are like kind of similar to each other. We try to keep the same protocol for the old six, six uh, tests. Of course, they are, we are injecting different structures to understand the like different physics based on the different structure that we are dealing with. <clears throat> and of course, we are just like also, we kept everything constant. So I, I explained to you in this slide what, what, are, what are these cycles that we have. So we, ha we had three different cycles for each test. So I call it cycle 1-1. One, one. So the purpose of this cycle was that we were controlling the, f the pressure. So we were increasing the pressure stepwise and monitoring the flow rate. So here you can see, for example, how does it look like. This is actually gives us the idea how is the injectivity or permeability of the structure before we do any test. So increase the pressure and look at the flow rate. If you plot it, it gives you a linear line and this gives you the injectivity, how much it is. So for example, for this case, the injectivity is that 0.95 liter per minute per megapascal. Then after a certain pressure, you will start having to, you start, you change the slope of this like a curve because you open the fractures, which is here. So in the second, like cycle 1.2, we were interested to capture these like uh, changes in the injectivity. And this is how it's, we call it in jacking pressure. This is exactly the pressure that you open the fracture, which is also indication of the normal stress on that fracture. So the first two cycles, I mean the cycle one, the first two, kind of ramping up the pressure, we will have an idea of the first injectivity. At the same time, we wanna also, if the, the fracture is kind of like the kind of closed, we also wanna open it. And this is the case. Then we have a stimulation case that we go flow rate control, something that they do it in industry. So we are in injecting the different flow rate stepwise and we try to actually shear the fractures because the fracture is open and we are also trying to shear it then we will repeat the same cycle as the first one at the end to, uh, to understand how much injectivity we changed. Here, for example, you see that we changed the injectivity. Actually, this is one of the tests that we didn't change the injectivity, but you see that in the next slide that we could change the injectivity by two or three orders. So this is the whole concept behind these protocols that we did. So here you can see the summary, like a six different stimulation we did in different boreholes, the amount of volume inject, the intervals, like different part of the boreholes. And here you can see the change of injectivity. So for some structures, which is like the S3, we didn't actually increase the injectivity that much. But we saw lots of seismicity. So these are the number of the seismic events we captured. At the same time, in the other structures, we could increase the injectivity by even three orders, but we couldn't see any kind of like the seismicity happening there. So we are interested to see if this is really a structure dependent or not. So we plot the number of events versus the change of injectivity. Red color shows the structure, which is east-west, and the 
the blue one is the one north, east, south, west. And you see that it's really structure dependent. When we are in this structure, east, west one, we have lots of seismicity, not that much change in injectivity, but the other structure is completely reverse. Also, we wanted to interest, we, are, we were interested to see also, is there any relationship with the total volume we inject with the seismicity? This is the whole concept of the seismologists that they believe that the, the, more, uh, the highest injection volume corresponds to the highest seismicity. And we just plotted that one. And at least for this kind of experiment, we don't see any really nice trend here that the more we inject, we see more seismicity. Uh, of course, we were also like during the, each of these six tests, we were looking at the pressure propagation and we have really different behaviors for the pressure propagation. Just by a quick look at this, like a pressure curves, you can see that we have really different like a kind of behaviors. We have somehow for some structures, we have really low pressure response on the monitoring, the order of 0.5 MPA, the which injection pressure was around seven, eight megapascal and some structures, we see that, oh, the pressure is changing like to up to six MPA. So we are dealing with a really heterogeneous fracture that it's also behaving really differently for different structures. One of the example is this, like the HS5, one of the hydro shearing that we did. So here you can see the, I, I just show you two snap, two cross section of the pressure propagation. Here it shows the pressure propagation we are injecting here and we are looking at the pressure front, how it looks like. And at 12 at noon, here is the how is the pressure propagation inside this structure because we have a structure exactly here. So you just plot this pressure propagation in this structure and see how the pressure is propagating. We look back again at 2.30 and you see it's completely different. So it looks like that also stimulation, when we were shearing, we were opening different channels. So we are really dealing with the different like a channels that is changing over time, the, amount, the maximum pressure, like how it propagates. Also, as I said, we look at also the seismicity. Here you can see, again, pressure, red curve, blue is the flow rate, and the number of seismicity. And here you can see the special distribution of the seismicity we monitor. This is one of the tests that we had the highest number of seismicity we could measure. So the interesting thing here is that first we are opening the pre-existing structure. You see there is no seismicity until we open the structures. And this happens around eight megapascal. Then in the second cycle, again, we open it the same structures because we, we jack it up. And if it opens up, then we close it again. Then we jack it up. Then we see a little bit seismicity. Then here is the, the, the hydro shearing phase that again, seismicity is gonna increase. And again here. So it looks like that Whenever the pressure goes above eight megapascal, we have seismicity. We have, like here, we don't see anything is flat, but as soon as the pressure goes above this line here, the imaginary line that we have eight megapascal, we see that there is an increase in the seismicity. And also, whenever the pressure is above this eight megapascal, which is somehow here, this line, we see a nice kind of correlation between the the seismicity and the amount of injection rate. So it's really important we have this kind of eight megapascal, which is not the jacking pressure, to induce the micro seismicity inside the borehole. And the last one, I just want to show you also some like uh, some of the data from the strain measurements. So these are showing the different strain measurement we have, and we can see that for some places we have like some the. So these are the trace of the strain along the borehole. So he, sorry. He's, here is the borehole depths, you can see. And here's over time, we are measuring continuously the strain using the FPG sensors in two different boreholes. And you can see there, I just put a cross section for different time here, and which you can see it here. And you can see here that negative is, first negative is compression, tension, uh, positive is tension, and you can see that we can see different shearing and opening of the structures based on the strain. Yes? What does negative pressure mean? It's not a pressure, negative strain. So this is the engineering convention. So negative strain is compression. Positive strain is so the... Ah, oh, no, 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 this is just the color thing. So it's just like, because I just interpolate. This is just a, like a quick and dirty plot for just showing this stuff. We don't have negative pressure, no. This is just for plotting. So it's actually zero. I just want to see how this pressure propagation is like happening. 
Here. Ah, this one. Oh, okay, the blue is actually it's not a pressure, it's flow rate. So you, what you actually do is that you start injecting, so increase the kind of like they start increasing the pressure, and at this time you shut down, you stop injecting. So the injection becomes zero, but still you have a pressure in the system that is like decaying. So we had this shutting phase because if you remember, I talked about Basel case that they, they inject, they saw the seismicity, they stop it. Then three days after, they see the seismicity. So in this section, we were interested to see if this shutting and we close everything, we pressure, keep the, the reservoir pressurized to see if we see any seismicity or not. Then after that, we open the valve. So you open the borehole, which is pressurized. You open, the water comes back because you want to depressurize everything. That's why the negative flow rate, it means that the water is coming out of from the borehole because you pressurized everything. So I just don't talk about that much. And quickly, I just talk about hydrofracking. We did also six hydrofracks, again, with the specific protocols that we had in mind. So we injected one cubic meter for each hydrofrac because that's the maximum amount we could inject because they were, they were scared that we may do lots of seismicity also during the hydrofrac. We had different protocols, so we just did a pulse test at the beginning to see that this, the interval is there is no fracture that we could create a fractures. Then we had a pressure breakdown part, uh, which is like we just inject with a, like a 10 liter per minute, and we just like increase the pressure in the borehole. We create the fracture, then it, it the pressure drops. Then we have a shut in. Then we have a, a main fracture propagation that we raised up the flow rate. At the same time, we were interested to this new trend that people are claiming that if you do cyclic of the injection, you could actually reduce the amount of seismicity. So we did also high, different frequency of the pre, like injection during this pressure propagation to see how it will affect in the existing, bo in the surrounding boreholes and also looking at the seismicity. Then we had the shut in, we closed it again. Then we have this test, which is similar to the cycle of the previous test, we, we wanted to know if we made a fracture, now how much would be the jacking pressure on this structure. So similar to the other one. And here you can see the different, like the hydrofrax that we did. So we didn't use all the time water here because, I mean, there is this idea which is developed by Detourney and Cheng that they are actually, they believe that, I mean, because we are not in the field case. So in the field, in the real field, you usually use really high flow rate and sometimes you use the viscosity. So you are somehow in the viscosity dominated mode. So you, whatever fracture you create, it will be perpendicular to the minimum stress. But if you go to low flow rate or low viscosity, you are in the regime which is called toughness dominated. So your hydrofrag actually, they propagate along the existing structures. So in this test, we decided to have three tests, which is here look like, showed by the blue, is that we do three tests with water and three tests with santan. So santan is the kind of like a powder that you actually, is almost in every food, I guess it's in the milk or also some foods that it's somehow it just thickened the material, so it's just like something that you can eat. So we added only 300 grams per one cubic meter and increased the viscosity by ter like to 30 centipos. So this amount of kind of increasing by 30 times this viscosity was somehow enough for us to go toward the viscosity dominated. So we also tried these things to just see the two end members of the kind of like a toughness dominated and the viscosity dominated. So I don't have that much data from those tests because as I said, it happened like three, four weeks ago, then we somehow, everybody went to the vacation, so nobody would look at the data because it was really tough two weeks. But some of the data we could see is that actually during the hydrofrac also without using any poropant or any other chemicals, we could also increase the injectivity by 1,800 times, I mean, not 1,800 times. Yeah, three orders, yeah, 1,800 times. So we could also see that because after that, we also conduct some hydraulic tests before and after quickly, and we could see that also for some hydrofrax, we could also in increase the injectivity. And just give you some idea here, you can see one of the hydrofrax that we actually make a direct connection to two boreholes, two monitoring boreholes. We inject it here, 
and there are hydrofrags somehow hit these two geo boreholes that we had the seismic sensors inside. And you can see that the amount of whatever we were injecting actually was coming out from the two boreholes. This is another test, which actually the water was even more. I mean, we tried to stop it, but I mean, we couldn't do that. But we had some flow meters. Here you can see some Arduino that we use for injecting the, for monitoring the, pre, the flow rate that we could measure how much is coming, which is more or less. And here you can see the shutting. We, somehow we stop injecting water and you see how like a fast we can see the response in the monitoring boreholes, which is somehow around 10 meters separated. And just right away we can see. So this is actually happened when we use Santan. So whenever we used water, we couldn't, actually we didn't make any direct connections and our fractures look like that is somehow went like the north is southwest, but whenever we use Santan, it actually starts going to different directions. So this is just a simple observation. I can tell you that the effect of Santan and changing viscosity by 30 times, ter by 30 times it actually changed the orientation of the fractures we had. And I guess this is Maurice's slide. I didn't use it, somebody, I guess Florian was using it, but I guess it's yours somehow. So this is the idea of the next phase of experiment we are doing. So the idea is that now we want to go back and actually inject water with different temperature. Of course, in this area, we cannot go really, like it's not really hard, hot rock. It's 12 degrees, the water of the tunnel all the time and the rock. So the idea is that we are going to inject zero degrees water for a long time, maybe like a two, three weeks. Then we just like leave it cool down, like I mean warm up again. Then we are gonna inject hot water and we are gonna look at the thermoelastic effects of this injection on the reservoir and what's gonna happen. And of course we need to just somehow hire more students to just start first analyzing this data, not the modeling. I guess modeling is really big to start right now, but first we analyze to just differentiate and un start understanding what's going on there before we go to the next scale. And by this one, I wanna thank also the team that we were there. And this is kind of the area that we have spent like almost like 100 days this, this year. So we were staying all the time here. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, did you guys try to see how reproducible the seismic response was for the same flow rate and the same to see whether you know, I guess we couldn't do that. I mean, that was the idea. That was the idea because we wanted actually we keep the injection protocol same for everything. And also the idea was that if we could actually reproduce the same responses. But we couldn't, I guess the most important effect was the structures. So whenever we were injecting, we tried actually to inject in the similar structures. But somehow you saw how was the flow passes that we were dealing with. So because of the amount of heterogeneity we have in the, in the, in the reservoir there, we couldn't actually reproduce even the pressure responses. I mean seismic, I guess it's the, like a, another level. Even the pressure response, we couldn't reproduce the same pressure response. If you could see it on those like uh, graphs that I showed you, none of these tests are similar to each other. Even though two of them are, in two of the tests we inject in the same structures because we, I said we have two lamprophiers that these are sheared over time and we have a brittle structures between. So first we inject one in this lamprophier here, the other time in the lower one. So it's a similar structures, same age, same kind of like a footprints, like everything is the same, but we couldn't get the same like the response. The other three structures also we did the same structures, no. It's not that easy, I guess. I, I think that you've actually asked me that question about re reproducibility. I think you put your finger on one of the biggest challenges for the geothermal industry yeah. in, in naturally fractured rock masses. Anything that you do, even just a 10, 10 degree temperature change, will cause nonlinear and partially irreversible changes in your rock mass. So what does that do for your ability to predict in the future? And we're struggling really with this. But, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jalali mentioned the, the earthquakes in Basel. And I want to emphasize that 
you know, the world community, the best geophysicists in the entire world fail completely in making any valuable predictions. Fail, totally. Uh, it's, it's a challenge, and that research team is trying to address exactly these, these issues. And I don't say why, because it's recording. Oh. I tell you after. <laughs> yeah. He's going to charge us two beers for the real secret. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, related to the initial saturation of the formation. Yes. Uh, is it unsaturated? I mean, pff, I don't know if you could use saturation for this. I mean, we are we are in granite, so I mean, I'm oil. I am from oil and gas, so I usually use use Darcy, but now somehow I'm working with high, like a hydraulic people, so I use transmissivity. So the transmissivity is 10 to the minus 14, so of the rock, not fracture. So 10 to the minus 14, you make it permeability, it's around 10 to the minus 21 square meter, and to Darcy is one nano Darcy. So your structure, your rock is really impermeable, your rock. Then the fractures we have is the order of like 10 milli Darcy the highest, like the, high, the most conductive, 10 to maximum 100 millidarcy. So we are in a really low permeable area. So, and the porosity we have there is also super low. The porosity we have also for the rock, I, I tell you it's like one or two percent. So I don't know if we could like really use the saturation for the rock or not. But for the structures we have, for the faults and shear zones that we have, yes, they are saturated. And Somehow we have some ventilation also, maybe around the tunnel is there like a bit dry because of the zone of ventilation, but we are actually dealing with a saturate, saturated area that... If, uh, if somebody wants to interpret uh, uh, pressure tensing yes. in the depth of working Yes. Uh, maybe because all of the world tests and analysis we are uh, working on saturated Yes. No, it's that's, I mean, actually, that's a good question. So if you saw, I mean, if you remember this, I mean, I didn't go through the, I just want to give you some idea of what we did. It's just, but if you look at here, actually, we did different methods for characterization. We didn't use the conventional test. So first thing is that this is like all the well tests that they are doing is, uh, the assumption is that it's a saturated porous media. We are dealing with heterogeneous fracture media, which is like, it's not porous media at all. So what we did is actually that first we did some conventional like well test analysis like a, a slog test or like a constant rate, constant head. But then we could estimate the transmissivity or permeability really good. But when we go to the storativity, it gives us really like a large uncertainty. So what we start doing is that we start doing this periodic injection test. So from like all the, like we moved from the conventional, like the well test to the, this periodic. Actually, actually this is really old, it's from 80s, that people from oil and gas, they start doing that, but there is a big like a discussion in the communities that some people say that these are not gonna give us really new information. Some people say that no, they're gonna give us something, but at least for our case, we found that this kind of method is really useful because what we do is that you see here the red curve, this is the injection rate. So we actually pulse the injection rate. So we make some pressure, like a pressure pulse with different frequency we put in the structures and we can do it single hole or like a, like a interference test. And we look at the pressure. Also, we can do it like in different ball holes. So you just do the cycles and you monitor also around. And what you are interested in is the amplitude and phase shift. And using like some signal processing and also having a model there, you can somehow get the idea of the diffusivity of the structures and also trans, like the permeability, then you can find the storativity. So these are the type of hydraulic testing we are doing now. We are not doing, I mean, we do also conventional, like a pulse test and stuff, but these are mostly actually interesting for us. No, we are not doing equivalent porous media for these structures. Yes. This is the application of geothermal. Yes. How are you going to decide how far apart the boreholes are? Because we could use ability, uncertainty, and structure. I mean. So you sort of have to drill 
yes, that, that, that's actually is the issue that I guess all the geothermal is dealing with. Because there is also like, I mean, this is, that's what actually we did for the boreholes that we have. So when I showed you this one, so for each boreholes, when we drilled, we knew what, how the borehole should be. For example, for strain boreholes, we knew that there should be kind of parallel to structures that we are going to inject because we want to see how they open up, or geo geophysic borehole, pressure boreholes. But we tried actually to drill these two injection boreholes without knowing anything. Just have an idea how the structure is. Actually, there is another experiment is happening in Switzerland in Hudson. So it's actually in the north, northeast. So they already get the permission, everything to drill this borehole. So the idea is that it's the actually industrial partner called Geo Energy Swiss. So they want to actually start drilling. Also, like they want to start drilling boreholes without knowing anything. They cannot use geophysics because the seismic four kilometer crystal and rock, good luck to find something. So their idea is that they're gonna start drilling boreholes in the depths of two, three kilometers. They stop, they do a mini frack. Somehow know how the in, in situ stress is. Then they wanna go kind of like, uh, per, like parallel to the minimum stress. They don't know. And that's actually, that's a big challenge in the geothermal. I guess what they are actually dealing is that every three or 400 meters, they want to stop, do a stress measurement, just know how it works. And if they hit a structure, they just analyze it to see that if this structure is there, like a runaway structures or they're going to just keep this. But I guess this is also another challenge that it exists. I don't know, Maurice, if you have any comments for this. I guess the crystalline is really, it's not like sedimentary rock. At least also we were dealing actually lots of problem here with the geophysics because we tried different geophysical methods. We used ERT, electrical resistivity, no chance. And the GPR also gives us some nice data, but now the question is that, I mean, GPR is not going to give us any data if we go to the real field scale. And the only, I guess, geophysical methods we might have is the seismicity, like acoustic emission. And that's a big challenge there and possibly tilt. I don't think even fiber optics, we could use the fiber uh, optics. Uh, Bijan? Oh, I, I think the tilt can actually get you uh, yeah, yeah, one or two. You had yeah. it. Yeah. I'll probably stick my neck out here, but I think that a tilt array mm -hmm. can give you a, uh, the ability to, for a deconvolution yeah. of, this, of the strain field at least an order of magnitude uh, finer scale than yeah. fiber yeah. optics. Yeah. But they need more to they use just 50 meters. Oh, I know. They you need an array. array yeah. maybe 50, maybe you have to have an yeah. array of. Yeah. So I didn't talk about this one, but here you see our tilt meter. It's the Jewel 711. I don't know, like, I mean, maybe, you know, and the resolution we have 0.1 micro radian, and the, sa the sampling frequency is 100 hertz. But we could see some well, stuff, no, uh, but we didn't have an array. Right. Yeah. You need uh, 10, you need uh, 10 nanoradian resolution. Yeah generally for, the, for, for mm -hmm. this kind of work. Yeah. And that's at least an order of magnitude more. Yeah, more it your, is, yeah. How much did that cost you? 5,000. Bijan, can't you build them for a dollar fifty each? <laughs> no, not quite, but Bijan has but, got a design that maybe will yeah. allow you to But uh, I suggested resolution. to him, he can actually, if he has something, we can actually use his stuff in September for the next phase. Well, we like that. You know? yeah. We'd like to talk about that. That would be great, yeah. But not for us. <laughs> no, he already said it's recorded, so we have a <laughs> proof. <laughs> that's negotiated. <laughs> yes, that's good. Uh, also, fiber, uh, the Bragg grading. Uh, why Bragg grading as a fiber optics technique? Uh, what was the, uh, the logic for that? So because that gives you extremely local yes. uh, data, yep. whereas uh, the distributed uh, strain sensors mm -hmm. can give you an average yeah. over a, a baseline. Yeah. So actually this is like, I mean, we wanted actually, you see the boreholes, how is they are like kind of completed. So we have two chain of the FPG and one continuous one. So we wanted to see actually the application of these two. So as you said, these are, they have a specific baseline, which is one meter. And you can see the points. They are not actually equally spaced based on the different structures that we are hitting. Actually, we put them in a chain and we use two chains in case one of them is just like we break it down, we have another chain that we are going to, we all 
we will have it to monitor. So here you can see the resolution of the FVG we have. So 0.1 micro strain. The best case, actually, we use the same integrator that Behrad was using here in Waterloo. Yeah, right. and Exactly the same. So then the resolution there was actually 10 micro strain. So the resolution was 100 times better FVG. And the other part, thing was that Hang the on. sampling whoa, whoa, freeze. Whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, too fast. You're, you're saying that the resolution with the uh, technique that Berard was using is 10 times better no. than the Bragg gradient? Bragg gradient was better. 10 times better. All right. Okay. Because if this is 0.1 micro strain, that one was 10 micro strain. 100 times better. So the one was the resolution, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the other thing was the sampling frequency. So for, with this one, we could go to the 1,000 hertz sampling. Okay. Because you don't actually you just like pass the, like a laser right. just through this like one meter baseline. But with the distributed, because we were actually making a loop in different boreholes, like six boreholes that it was going. And for each integration, the best case, we could just have every two minutes one measurement. Right. So, so but, but with that with that kind of cable, you could have a cable 100 kilometers long. Yes. Whereas here, you're limited. Exactly. And the other thing, actually, the 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 nice things about distributed was that. So here we did, and I mean for for a stimulation, I would say that this was much more better. For the scale. Yes. Yeah. But when we went actually for hydrofracking, the distributed actually gave us better answer because we were propagating the fractures. So whenever the fracture hits one of these sensors we could see. But we distributed, actually, we could see nicely it hits in the same resolution that we have. So distributed, I guess, is better to know where the fracture hits, but understanding the amount of strain that their FVG looks like better. But of course, when we go maybe four kilometer downhole, distributed is much, I mean, if we could use distributed there, it gives us better like a kind of data. That. But I mean, for this scale, I guess FPG gave us better. Also, interpretation of FPGs is much more nice, easier that's, that's than the distributed. I didn't realize that you could do 100 hertz on a, on a Bragg grading. Yes. Wow. Thousand. Thousand. Hertz. Thousand, yeah, yeah. But of course, it depends on the integrator that you buy. So it's actually a low frequency seismometer as well. Then. Yes. Yeah. And also, I don't know about vision, how much is the sampling frequency of your tilt meter. But here, we were working with the 100 hertz. OK. So it's, it's just 100 hertz, yeah. Yes. So, I mean, yes or no? So the issue is that first we wanted, especially for the tilt meter and strain and pressure, we needed to know how we drill the boreholes. Because we knew we have the geological model and we didn't know how this kind of, kind of like the pressure propagation is gonna affect our the stimulation protocols. Also, we needed to write a risk report. Actually, we wrote a 300 pages for two weeks experiment, we, read, we wrote a 300 pages risk report that what gonna be effect of this, like the test on the surrounding experiment and also if you make a size mystery. So for this one also, we need to have some models. So actually for the risk report, I used the model I developed here. So it's a 2D thermohydromechanical, which is give us like a fair estimation for the 2D, like a simple estimation, which was good. But for the strain and tilt, we needed like a 3D model. So the big challenge was that there isn't, I, would, I could just say that there isn't any reservoir scale model that could, 3D could model thermohydromechanical of the fracture reservoir. I mean, you get all the physics. Yeah, there are models that they can just understand a specific part of the physics, but you have also the hydromechanical plus seismicity. I don't think there is any commercial that we could use. So we start using 3D. We actually couldn't even discretize ourselves. Because if you see any 3 deck or flag models that they are using, actually they only use vertical fractures. But when you go inclined fracture, they cannot do anything also. So we used, we gave the, 
the project to Itasca, and they did this like a modeling for us. But each model for the four hours stimulation that we do the stimulation took us four weeks. So it's a really challenge for the modeling of this experiment. So we use this like rule of thumb modeling to model this one. But now also at ETH we have a modeler groups that they are developing their own code. So we have in-house code developers that they are just kind of using the combination of finite element, finite volume, and it's the code that is called CSMP. So they are like there is a model that they are parallel working with us. So they were also in the field. They see also how it looks, and they are just parallels are going to move or that. But I don't think there will be any modeling of this project coming up in the next two, three years. Johnny uh, Rothquist uses uh, flag top, stuff. top 2 and Flag 3D yeah. uh, iteratively. Uh, is your group kind of following the same idea? So you're using a large scale model, or are you actually trying to use a model that has discrete elements in it? Yeah. No, we actually, the kind of modeling we are doing is similar to what they are doing in, in the. Berkeley. No, not Berkeley, Livermore. Uh, Livermore. So the, the Joe, ideas. Joe Morris? Exactly. Just we have a student actually working with them, so he tried actually to model some of the hydrofrags. Still, they are missing some physics there. But the idea actually we have is that we are developing a platform that you just have a library. Then you just want to say that I want to model hydromechanical. Then you just go and, and with the finite element. So you just go run, call the finite element solver. You just call the hydraulic with the different like physical processes you want. To, to be inside the model. So it's already this library developed. So you call different things. You call also mechanics. Then you just say that, oh, I want to have an iterative coupling. So I just want to run or fully coupling together. So you call everything together and just run it. So it's kind of like ComSol multi-physics. Exactly. With better THM. Uh, yes. So that's the whole idea. Also in the supercomputer, because in the normal oh, yeah. PCs, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So it's the so this is the whole concept also because this is also one of the needs for the geothermal also in Switzerland that they want to have a called traffic light system that whenever you actually you inject you kind of predict or what's going to happen in the next 10 or 15 minutes in the case of the pressure seismicity deformation that it gives you a traffic light that where, where you should stop the injection or you should keep going or just like Kind of be careful, just do some. I have this. a problem with traffic light systems. Yes. I'm colorblind. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, well, I would like to, I'd like to thank Reza, but also I want to emphasize that, uh, kind of in response to your question that triggered the, the responses, is that this is the most challenging simulation problem that we have encountered in, in geomechanics, in the history of geomechanics. Because it's uh, the reversibility issues, nonlinear issues, extreme nonlinearity, like the, you saw those conductivity tests, bifurcation issues. Uh, you know, every time you have a shear event, you actually change the fundamental nature of the system that you're trying to model. So it's evolutionary in time in addition to all of these nonlinearities. And even trying to do a first order analysis in a strongly coupled THM system turns out to be extremely challenging. The prize, geothermal energy, part of it, uh, but also things like uh, deep waste disposal, uh, carbon dioxide sequestration, uh, reservoir engineering in naturally fractured carbonates, uh, steam injection in uh, fractured carbonates. Remember that there's about three trillion barrels of oil in the world in fractured carbonate, of heavy oil in the world in fractured carbonate, and very, very few successful projects. So all of those uh, kind of technologies uh, are, are linked to this, to this kind of uh, engineering and scientific work. So it's very challenging, Reza, and thank you for sharing your experiences yeah, with us. Thank you.